If medieval buildings were as crude as people love to claim, they would have folded centuries ago. Roofs would have sagged. Floors would have twisted apart. Bridges would have failed under their own weight long before World War II ever rewrote the map of Europe. Yet here we are, standing beneath beams cut when steel was rare, math was manual, and wood was worked green, wet, and unpredictable. That survival was not luck. It was engineering. And one quiet technique made all the difference. This is the story of the medieval wood press. Not romantic, not mystical, ruthlessly practical. A method designed to discipline living timber into obedience before it ever carried a roof, a ship, or a shield into battle. Medieval carpenters fought the enemy hiding inside fresh wood. Freshly cut timber is weak. Every serious carpenter knows that. Moisture saturates the fibres. The grain wants to move. As it dries, it twists, cups, splits, and tears itself apart from the inside. Medieval builders understood this not as theory, but as lived consequence. A warped beam didn't just look bad. It collapsed floors. It cracked joints. It killed people. They did not have kiln drying. They did not have pressure-treated lumber. They didn't even have standardized sawmills in most regions. What they had was observation and patience and a refusal to let nature dictate failure. Instead of letting planks dry freely and, well, just hoping they stayed straight, Medieval carpenters intervened early while the wood was still green. They applied controlled pressure during the drying process, forcing the fibres to compress inward rather than tear outward. This wasn't about flattening boards. It was about restructuring the wood at a cellular level. The medieval wood press was simple, but honestly, brutally effective. The press itself was almost offensively basic. Two heavy horizontal beams, upright posts forming a rigid frame, and a pressure system built from threaded wooden screws or wedge-driven mechanisms. No iron was required. No advanced metallurgy. The genius was in how it was used. Fresh planks were stacked between the beams with narrow gaps to allow airflow. Pressure was applied evenly across the stack. Not crushed, not rushed, just firm enough to deny the wood freedom to move on its own terms. As moisture slowly exited the timber, the fibres were forced to settle into alignment. The surface and the core dried at closer rates, reducing internal tension. Instead of the outer layers shrinking faster and tearing against the wetter interior, the whole plank dried together under discipline. This is why press boards behave differently, you see. They did not explode under tension. Instead, they absorbed shock. They bent in a predictable way. And, well, they stayed true. Here's the part most people miss. Medieval wood pressing didn't just prevent warping, it actually improved the wood itself. Compression increased the density. Fibre alignment, interestingly enough, mimicked the structure of slow-growth timber, even when the original tree had grown quickly. That meant stronger beams, without having to wait generations for those perfect trees. Guild records from Northern Europe note that pressed planks were, in fact, reserved for high-stress rolls. Anchor beams, floor joists, shield boards, ship planking. Really, anywhere failure meant catastrophe. This was not decorative wood. 
This was survival wood. Pressed boards could handle dynamic loads better. When a floor flexed under marching feet, or a ship slammed against waves, compressed fibers distributed stress instead of fracturing. That reliability was worth weeks or months of waiting under pressure. Modern construction obsesses over speed. Medieval carpentry respected time. Depending on thickness, planks remained under compression for weeks or even months. Pressure was adjusted gradually as the wood shrank. The goal was not to force the final shape instantly, but to deny the wood opportunities to misbehave during its most vulnerable phase. By the time a board left the press, it had already spent its worst drying years restrained. It had learned its limits before being installed into a structure where movement was no longer tolerated. That's why timber frame buildings from the 13th century show straighter lines and fewer stress fractures than many modern builds that rely on rushed mechanically dried lumber. Wood pressing was not common knowledge. It was guild knowledge. Apprentices learned it by doing, not by reading. It was intentionally undertaught passed down only to those who earned it. That secrecy protected standards and preserved reputations. A guild known for stable buildings stayed in demand. Archaeological finds across northern Europe have uncovered remnants of wooden screw presses in workshop sites. These weren't experimental tools. They were infrastructure adapted from wine and oil presses already familiar in agricultural life, then refined for timber. This wasn't innovation out of nowhere. It was intelligent borrowing, optimized through experience. Why medieval builders feared wood movement more than rot? Rot takes time. Movement kills fast. A twisting beam destroys joinery. A cupping plank lifts floors. Splitting propagates weakness through entire frames. Medieval builders obsessed over stability because repair was expensive and failure was unforgiving. Pressing solved the movement problem at the root. A plank denied the ability to warp during drying was far less likely to do so later. Its internal stresses had already been resolved. This is why surviving medieval halls and barns often show uniform spacing, consistent beam profiles and long-term structural calm. The wood had already done its fighting before it was ever installed. This is not a lost art, it's a neglected one. Anyone milling their own lumber with a chainsaw mill, or, you know, an Alaskan mill, can actually replicate the medieval press using modern materials. All you need are two strong beams, four vertical posts, and, well, threaded rods with nuts to replace the old wooden screws. The principle really does remain identical. Fresh boards are stacked with spacers for airflow. Pressure is applied gradually. In the first week, adjustments are made daily as the wood shrinks. After that, it's every few days until stabilization. The pressure should be firm, but never crushing. The result is lumber that, quite frankly, resists warping far better than air-dried boards left unattended.
for survivalists building cabins, sheds, tool handles, or, you know, long-term infrastructure, this method dramatically extends the usable life of timber, especially in harsh climates with wide humidity swings. Pressing can even rehabilitate warped boards, actually. The same principle works in reverse. Warped boards can often be corrected using controlled moisture, gentle heat, and steady pressure over time. This, interestingly, mirrors medieval shield-making techniques where curved boards were shaped under compression without sacrificing strength. You know, understanding how moisture and pressure interact gives modern builders a massive advantage. Wood, well, it stops being unpredictable once you stop letting it do whatever it wants. The real lesson behind the medieval wood press, if you think about it, goes much deeper. When people admire medieval buildings, they praise scale and ornament. But what they miss is restraint. These builders didn't romanticize materials. Instead, they studied them. They engineered improvements with deliberate processes rooted in observation and patience. That mindset is why structures built before industrialization still stand, while, you know, some modern buildings fail within just a few decades. The medieval wood press wasn't ceremonial. It wasn't symbolic. It was honestly just necessary. And once you understand it, you never look at an old beam the same way again. If you want more overlooked techniques, forgotten tools, and hard-earned knowledge from the early world, subscribe to History HQ. Share this with someone who still thinks medieval builders were just guessing their way through history. These skills survived because they worked. And, well... They still do.